So, um, good morning. It's working. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to <laughs> welcome to the first seminar uh, offered from by my lab. Uh, this seminar was organized by my team, and thank you very much for joining us in person and also online. Uh, so, I'm particularly um, very happy to introduce to you <laughs> Dr. Shamini Ayaduri. So, Dr. Shamini is a Bachelor, uh, bachelor of Science uh, from National uh, University of Singapore. Uh, also, did Master of Science in Imperial College, London, United Kingdom. PhD in McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Currently, she is a postdoctoral fellow at Donnelly Center for Cellular and Biomolecular Research, University from the University of Toronto, and Princess Margaret Cancer Research Center from Toronto, Canada. She's also director of Panoramics, a vision neuroartist. Uh, received a postdoctoral awards um, from Metax Accelerate Program, Industrial Award in Partnership and also as ambassador, chair, education, and researcher, uh, Subi Community uh, Brain Cancer in Canada, and also president of Peach Masters Club, uh, Toastmasters International Toronto, Canada. Thank you very much for coming. It's a real pleasure to stay with us. Thank you. Pleasure is mine, and I just stepped down from my role as a president. So yeah, I need to update that. Um, is it okay? Okay. So thank you for having me here. Um, I'm going to start, but um, I'll try to keep it as casual as possible. So if you have a dying question, you can ask me, you can stop me and ask me, or we can wait till the end. Yeah, so whichever it suits you. So, um, no, wait. So today, so my title is discovering hierarchical patterning in glioblastoma architecture. So it's really about looking at patterns, right? So if you, if I were to look at you, you're just a room full of people. But if I were to look at patterns, then I will see that people from the same lab tend to group together. So a computational algorithm will pick that out. So this is the biological diversity, the pattern, patterns that we see every day in our lives in nature. And now we want to describe them because all these patterns have a significance. They have a functional significance. They are not random. So moving on. Okay, so for some of you, I don't have to introduce what is glioblastoma. So glioblastoma, or GBM for short. So of all the adult gliomas, it is the most devastating. It is very aggressive and prognosis is extremely poor. So the overall survival is about one to two years. There are some institutes around the world where they boast a five year uh, life expectancy, but this is due to surgical resection. So they do supratotal surgical resection and you can actually increase it to five years, but that's very rare. And the standard of care, quite sadly, which is chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery, it hasn't really changed much in the, in the last two decades. So right now, as everyone knows, we're going through this molecular revolution, right? So everyone is talking about single cell RNA sequencing, everyone is talking about spatial transcriptomics, everyone is talking about higher dimensional uh, proteomics data, imaging data sets, right? So we are in this phase where we have so much of data, all right? You have all this molecular data and we are trying to, we are trying to, we are actually starting to understand what all of this means. So I'm just going to introduce some of the landmark papers. They are not necessarily the best papers, and they also not necessarily have the, have the concepts that I personally agree with, but they are kind of driving the field, and they have kind of like introduced like key points, you know, where we are starting to consider things like how heterogeneity affects GBM and all types of cancer and how much of this variance can we utilize for, let's say, therapeutic discovery. So one of the 
very famous papers is the Neftal paper. So they actually came up with this uh, concept that all glioblastoma, when it's in their single cell state, they kind of have this gradient, right? So they are a mix of OPCs, oligodendrocyte-like, neuronal-like, astrocytic-like. So there is this uh, gradient. They kind of mimic the neurodevelopmental um, hierarchy, all right? Even though no one has come up with anything conclusive to explain why uh, GBM tends to mimic this. And this was a paper that I was a part of, which kind of described the same thing that the Neftal paper showed, except that we decided to copy the fetal brain um, trajectory and to map GBM cells. So even with all the CNV, the copy number variations, the somatic variation, we still find this neurodevelopmental property, all right? So every lab likes to think that, including my lab, they like to think that their naming process or procedure or hierarchy or labels is the best, but everything overlaps with each other. So you have this um, other paper which looked at it from a metabolic uh, point of view. So they derived that you can actually bin all of these cells into their metabolic profiles. But these metabolic profiles, all right, they also can be overlaid over these two maps because we know that astrocytic mesenchymal cells have a different, uh, a different metabolic signature as compared to, let's say, your stem cell-like, progenitor-like cells. So everything kind of relates to each other. And then recently in my lab, my supervisors together with Peter Dux, they published this paper where they introduced the concept of the gradient following a wound healing gradient. And many of the, in fact, the wound healing part of the, of the gradient overlaps the mesenchymal and the astrocytic arm of whatever that was discovered in the previous papers as well. So everything is overlapping. But the key point is you have this gradient that exists. But then you have at the protein level. So the protein level is something that has not been well understood yet. It is still something that I would consider weak. And there's a lot of mismatch in the protein expression with your RNA expression. But some of these protein labels, some of these signaling studies do indicate this same hierarchical structure. So every study actually reinforces the notion that GBM, in GBM, we have this neurodevelopmental inflammatory signature, and it's kind of like a, like a flow, it's a gradient that exists. And the point and the purpose is, I think what, one important thing that we all need to ask is that why is it that it likes or it wants to mimic this uh, neurodevelopmental gradient? And then of course now we are in the spatial age. So one of the key important facts about GBM is that, so at the end of the day, you have to intervene. When you actually treat a patient, you are not treating the tumor you are actually treating a person. So this tumor is in the brain of a person. This tumor is interacting with the brain. It is interacting with the normal tissues. It is getting supplies from the normal tissue. And if you really think about it, the tumor is not exactly the devil, right? It wants to have this parasitic, symbiotic relationship with the host, right? So it wants to survive. So in order to survive, it cannot be too brutal. So it is hijacking all these mechanisms. So spatial is a way in which we can understand this. And I kind of like the Winkler lab papers because they do a lot of hardcore biology. So everything is bio bioinformatics, computational. And even though I'm going to be showing a lot of computational, um, what do you call it, um, data analysis, but at the end of it, the, the, the really fun part about reading the Winkler papers is that they show it in action in the tissue itself. Yeah, and so that is the value of spatial. So, okay, so I'm actually particularly referring to the cellular gradient. So in the fetus, right, you have your radial glial cells. 
So your radial glial cells will give rise to your progenitor, your neural progenitor, they'll give rise to your astrocytic. So it is kind of like a key signature. And it's not just one lab, it's different labs, and they're finding the same gradient. They're just naming it differently, but they're overlapping. And it's always this gradient, there's always a stem cell. There's no hard proof that it is exactly uh, radiating from an actual radial glial like um, cancer cell, but it has similar patterns, similar cell types. Yeah, so it's a cell type uh, gradient. Yeah, thank you. All right. So we are in the age of this high dimensional molecular data. So this is something that I actually like to reflect on. As I say, in reality, we are treating a living person and their quality of life is disrupted. So we're not just trying to find a cure. We have to remember that we are trying to give them back their dignity, all right? These, these patients, and I was an ambassador with uh, Brain Cancer Canada, and she, is, she was the chief ambassador, and her husband passed away. And this is a scan of her husband, which she has allowed me to actually present during my presentations. And that is the tumor, all right? So it's not just a tumor, all right? When the tumor is there, it's growing, it is pressing onto the ventricles, all right? You have edema, his globus pallidus is affected, he has functional, his functional capacity is limited. He's not able to move. He has seizures and she practically has to be there and hold him when he falls uncontrollably because he has no control over his life. He, she even has to support him when he goes to the, to the washroom. All right. So the thing is, we can, when we look or when we, when we treat it, all right, it's not just a mess, all right. It's an, it's an intelligent mess, all right? It has structure, it has architecture, and the cells are not functioning in isolation, all right? They're working together. So they have local as well as they have broad communication. And recently, there's a lot of papers that are coming out that show that they engage with each other. And you have all these communities and populations that we find in our normal organs that exist in tumors as well. And if we study the organization and architecture, I believe we can complement the molecular uh, data that we have. And I'll explain a bit more why I feel that this architectural concept is important. But first, I would like to just uh, go a bit in depth as to what I mean by architecture. So what do I mean by architecture? So I was a pure wet lab biologist for many, many years. And I started to do a lot of imaging studies during my PhD, all right? So when I looked at all these images of my cell culture, of my tissues, I realized that single cell RNA sequencing or any kind of sequencing, transcriptomics or protein staining was not capturing what I was seeing. You're not capturing the patterns of it, right? But at the same time, you, are, you want to ask yourself, and I've been, I've been asked the same question, what's the point of studying patterns? Like, what's the logic of it, right? So there's this paper, and I would encourage everyone to read this paper. It's a very old paper, all right? Really, like, the author has practically hand-drawn everything, yeah. But it's, like, one of my favorite papers, yeah, because he hand-drew everything, like, so he's my favorite person right now. So the logic of monsters, right? So it's... Is basically what we, so this is something that we don't see in, sorry to say, current papers, is that old papers, they are just to the point. They have one concept, they will deeply validate or they will deeply explain it, they will believe in it, and they will just, you know, explain it. Uh, current papers, you have like 21 supplementary figures, which I don't know why you have to have 21 supplementary figures. So anyway, one of the questions that the author posed is, why do we not see monsters? We are humans, right? We have two hands. We don't see mermaids. Mermaids are just a concept of our imagination. It does not exist. Dragons, okay, maybe they existed, I don't know, but you know, they don't exist anymore. We haven't found any skeletons to prove. But the reality is that at the end of the day, despite our genomic diversity, 
there is only a discrete set of phenotypic output that is maintained, right? And that is a limit that is imposed by our external environment. And our external environment is not just the it's not just our world, it also includes our universe that we live in. So there are rules that we cannot break, right? There are certain architectural rules. So why do we not see monsters? So nature has restrictions on Darwinian evolution, right? So I know it's, it might sound a bit philosophical, but I think it's kind of uh, brings you down to earth because the second point is he brought up, he brings up is that nature is also seldom peaceful. Even when it comes to something like Siamese twins or conjoined uh, twin defects, all right? The same types, all right, of defects is preserved across the species. It's not different. In humans, all right, the kind of uh, conjoined twins that we discover or we observe is also um, found in, let's say, in uh, uh, what do you call it, in other species as well. So even when it comes to defects, right, it is conserved. So there's a limit to which deformities or our existing phenotypes can actually be expressed. So, you know, it's like leaves, right? At the end of the day, you can have different types of leaves, right? But they all have to point upwards to the sun. They have to modulate themselves and they have to have a certain, um, what do you call it, leaf structure. And there are pattern descriptors which actually um, study these uh, leaf structure and patterns and shapes. And then this is something that I think is very important, at least in my point of view. So everyone is talking about heterogeneity, right? Diversity, heterogeneity. If every single GBM sample is so heterogeneous and every single sample patient is so different from one another, that is a lot of variance. And just imagine if you have to develop, um, what do you call it, a personalized medicine for every single patient. How are you going to predict for every single patient or every single human being that this is going to be your personalized treatment before you even know that they have tumor or not? Because it seems like you cannot predict this variance. The variance seems unlimited. Or maybe it is just something that we have not been able to grasp because our techniques are limited, right? So we are a bit behind, right? But what we do know is that there's a lot of invariance as well. So what the author, I, I really thought he was putting things in such a logical sense is that, and you know, that's why you know it's the logic of monsters. What he was trying to say is that, yes, you can have different species, right? But within that species, you will have a lot of heterogeneity, all right? But between species or even between, yeah, between like species, there's always a boundary, right? So they all belong to a discrete space. So it's like GBM. They can have a lot of variants, all right? By the end of the day, they seem to like to mimic or adopt the neurodevelopmental pathway. They like to adopt a certain metabolic profile. So maybe within GBM itself, we can subcategorize them, all right? We can study what is it that binds them together, right? Because at the end of the day, they are all growing in the brain. And there's one important thing that, that I always think about is the fact that when it comes to um, de novo GBM, right? GBM that um, first starts off in the brain. So GBM that, um, de novo GBM never metastasizes outside the brain. It just doesn't do that. But tumors from the rest of the body, in many parts of the body, they can metastasize to the brain, right? So the environment is restrictive, yeah. So when we have all these points that nature is seldom wasteful, invariance also has value as much as variance. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't study heterogeneity. I'm just saying that, you know, there is the other side of the coin that we need to bear in mind. And when we think about what is the limitation? Why is it that it cannot evolve beyond? Like there are studies that have shown you can take a, a, a brain cell and you can push it and you can make it behave like a, like a heart cell, right? Everything is there, all right? So what is limited is its environment. 
So we see the same patterns as I said. So you do see neurodevelopmental mechanisms that are conserved. It has, it's not exactly a devil. It forms connections with normal neurons. It actually um, forms synaptic connections. It has the capacity to regenerate and to communicate. And so basically it is, it is, I'm coming from an engineering point of view, I guess. So you can have different types of buildings, right? So my father used to be a technician and used to, to, to tell me, um, so I'm from Singapore, I was born in Singapore. So he used to tell me this used to be nothing that was just, uh, what do you call it, trees and forests and swamps. And he used to tell me what was the engineering that was done to actually cr uh, kind of, uh, you know, build all the skyscrapers that some of you might know that exist in Singapore now. But the thing is, at the end of the day, the ground engineering rules, all right, the infrastructure is the same, all right? They are shared, but your building, your design might look different on the outside. Okay, that is your choice, right? That is the architect's choice. It's the same as a, as a house. A house, the concept is the same. You have a kitchen, you have rooms, all right, but how you design the patterns, everything is up to you. So from my point of view, this is not just a random shape. This is not just a random organization. There's significance to this organization. And where I'm coming from is, of course, I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer. So I'm using computer vision and spatial transcriptomics and all this to analyze. So that's where. So I know that, I think I heard from uh, Marilini that there are researchers here you're doing a morphometric analysis of your single cells. You are growing organoids in your, in your culture. You're doing maybe spatial transcriptomics. You're maybe you're doing tissue staining or you're growing um, cells and you are imaging them by phase contrast. So every single aspect of this from the single cell to cells which organize themselves into organoids or into flat um, sheets of uh, cells or into tissue or into organs, there are patterns in this. And there is a reason to how they organize themselves. And when it comes to tumor, we don't know what uh, these patterns are. So I'm gonna show these images. So these images, um, I um, stained these GBM images, all right? And I particularly chose these images and they, are, they don't look good here, but I'll just point it out. So these are blood vessels, all right? So the thing is, there are different types of blood vessels. So when I used to briefly um, speak to a pathologist, she used to explain to me that there are garland-like uh, blood vessels, there are these uh, glomeruli-like -like blood vessels, and then there are blood vessels that look like arteries, they are hardened. And the thing is, no one really knows why is it that uh, they exist or are they random or are they just part of this, uh, what do you call it, um, random evolution or is there a reason, you know, for, these, for the existence of these different types of blood vessels. And the reason why I got so, um, okay, maybe a bit obsessed about all this is because I was treating my mice with um, these um, antisense, all right, drugs from Ionis. And I found that there were some structures or ECM um, regions where the drug was just not reaching them, all right? So I'm injecting them into the ventricles. They are supposed to be circulated and they are supposed to go around to all the cells. But I see that some cells are not uptaking and some ECM, all right, extracellular matrix, you can see that the, the antisense is just not reaching there, all right? But you can see that just above it in the cortex, you can see lots of this, all right? So if the drug is so disparate, all right, it is because I reasoned, it's because it is meeting all these different structures, right? So this is like all these blood vessels that you see, that I see, and I just never got the chance to compute them. And you have this really large blood vessel here, and I know that you cannot see, but they're actually all these um, fiber tracks um, 
and it's visible on my laptop. We can take a look later. And then here, these are astrocytes. So astrocytes, as all of you know, they are star-shaped. I know that there are all these papers that will say that their segmentation program is the best, you know, and they can segment very difficult cell types. That's actually not true. It is very, very difficult. It's impossible right now for computer vision because computer vision algorithms are not as powerful as our human vision, right? So we cannot segment our astrocytes. But there are computer vision tools that can predict this star-like pattern, but in reference to another cell. So we are going to leverage on that. I think we should leverage on that. So I've broken my talk into two parts, cell-driven organized that. So the first part is just to show that cell-driven organizational patterns exist, and I'm going to use a very simple model. And then part two is where I'm going to introduce um, some uh, new analysis that I've done using spatial transcriptomics on the Xenium. So sub-driven organizational patterns exist. So when I, when I started this project, it was in the middle of COVID. So uh, it's kind of like actually I had nothing to do and I was dying to do something. So I was very fortunate that we had this uh, whole about 15 data sets of face contrast uh, images that was generated by the Aerosmith and the Dirks lab. So uh, Peter Dirks is a neurosurgeon and um, Cheryl Aerosmith, she's, um, she works in, um, she's the director of the Structural Genomics uh, Institute in Toronto. So what they did was they extracted GBM from the patients, but they, they dissociated the cells and they grew it in stem cell media. So I think that it, this is true for a lot of cancers. So a lot of cancers, there are a lot of researchers who believe that tumors are driven by cancer stem cells. So in GBM, we call it glioma stem cells. And it is, it is true, you can see the signatures. So the way we enrich is that we grow them in media that is used to grow neural stem cells, all right? So it is proven to enrich for neural stem cells and uh, is just uh, mimicked for, for GBM, all right? So we enrich for these stem cells and then we plate them into three, so they plated it into 384 well plates, all right? So I was totally blind to this experiment. I was not part of this. So they plated it and then they imaged it over 12 to 16 days over different time points. So in total, there was, I used 17,600 images, all right? So these are GSEs that were grown in stem cell media alone. So my purpose was, um, so if you, so all of you who, all those who do um, cell culture, so when you grow your cells, right, in culture, you see that they're taking on these different forms, right? So you have your single cell, which are taking on these different forms, but it's not just the single cells, right? So I'm going to show. So if you look at these images, right? Okay, it's a bit better. So the first thing is that's obvious that everyone will notice is single cell diversity, right? So you see these are, these are very branched, all right? These are very pale looking. And then we have these cells here, which are very dense, all right? And then you have these broad cells here, all right? So it's true. So someone couple of, uh, a couple of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I had a couple of comments. Some of the comments was that, oh, you don't know what cells these are, right? Um, so how do you know? Um, so how are you going to compute? But the argument is that I don't have to know what these cells are. The cells are behaving and they are spreading out and they are having this morphometry because of their inherent biology, all right? So yes, I know that shortcoming, all right, caveats, is that this is a laminin coated plate, okay? And when they did this experiment, they did not... When you... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is the perfect case, perfect, perfect scenario. 
they will die. They will die. Yeah. And then you have to wait for them. So it depends on the technique of the lab. So when, when I used to do this, we used to grow as spheres. So we will wait and then they'll grow as spheres and then we'll enrich for them. But sometimes um, they will coat it, they will coat laminin and then they will, they will just add the cells and then they'll just remove the um, cells that don't attach and then they'll just wait for a few passages. We do, we do. Yeah, yeah, and I won't even, I won't even say that we grow organoids. That would be an insult to those who really grow organoids. Ours is just small, yeah, yeah, really, yeah, it's just small spheres, yeah. Organoids, growing organoids is actually difficult. Yeah, these are all plated on laminin, yeah. So it is, it's very debatable. Some people will argue that laminin creates a homogeneous uh, environment, and I agree, actually. You can see it by single cell RNA sequencing that uh, growing them as spheres uh, keeps them heterogeneous. But which is the more true form, whether it's the laminin coated one or the, or the ones in spheres, to, I, I don't know the answer. I think the, the, the truth is somewhere in between. Yeah. It's just two main, main fields of thought of growing. Yeah. So, but for imaging, we have to seed them anyway, flat. Yeah. So when they did this study, uh, just a bit of background, they did it because they wanted to, to treat them with drugs, right? So um, if, I, if it was me, I would have done spheres and I would have coated them and done like flat cells as well. But this was particularly done because they were going to um, treat them. So you can see all this diversity, right? But the thing is, um, my focus was that as the cells grow, they are also forming organizational patterns as well. So this is what I would call um, anisotropism, all right? So anisotropy is actually to describe directional patterning. So it is commonly used in papers where they talk about microfilaments, you know? So you have microfilaments, your GFAP, your neurofilaments, you know, when in, so I'm not a, I'm not an expert in molecular biology, but when your filaments are lined up in parallel, all right? They take on parallel stands. We call them, they are, which means that they are aligned in an anisotropic manner. And if they are random, all right, so sometimes when your microtubules, when they are all uh, what, do you, what do you call uncoupled, all right, and they are all uh, jumbled up together, we call it isotropism, right? So it's random, so there's no direction. So I can put a point here and there's no direction. The cells are randomly pointing at any one direction, but here, I can see that here the cells are all in parallel and they are aligned. So sometimes, all right, in some of these glioma stem cells, they have this orientation. So the question is, is this random or is this uh, something that is inherent to their biology? All right. And the thing, and the, the thing is, right, the rationale is, I feel that you're taking all these images, so many images, and if you're going to just read out from your drug, just viability, you're losing out a massing, massive amount of, um, um, what do you call it, um, image content that you can utilize. And another thing is that I know that this, uh, there's this very famous te technique called cell painting from uh, Anne Carpenter from the, Broad, from the Broad Institute. So she's the one who came up with cell profiler. So the thing is, if you want to spend time staining your cells, all right, and catching all these features, all right, it's also time consuming and you might even kill yourselves. And is it necessary? So you have all these patterns that I can see. And then you also observe um, situations where the cells are not overlapping each other. So they are geometrically aligned. So they actually do space optimization. So they optimize their space management. But then you can also see in other cell lines, they don't really care about space optimization. They're just growing over each other, all right? So you see all these diverse patterns, but the human eye is horrible at finding patterns. We will see patterns when it's not there, and we will not see patterns 
um, many steps. So yeah, so I went on to, um, so what I wanted to do, I wanted to quantify all these patterns. So at that time, I was very new to this concept. So I decided, okay, let's just use Cell Profiler because they have 29 features, all right? So these features are mathematical algorithms. They are mathematics. They, some of them are actually from, um, you know, radio transmission when back then when they used to, when they had to actually ensure that when you call someone, the message is received by the person who's receiving your call at the other end. So things like Shannon Entropy <clears throat> and the whole informational algorithms. So this is part of it. So what it actually does, to put it simply, when you have an image, right? <clears throat> when you have an image, an image is just pixels, right? So the pixels are actually a representation of your cells, all right? Okay, and what GLCM, the gray level co-occurrence matrix, all right, which is about 13 algorithms from Cell Profiler, what it's doing is, is just computing spatial pixel frequency distribution statistics. So it's just computing different ways in which these pixels are arranged with each other, all right? And then there are all these algorithms which I am not going to go through in detail, but I'm more than happy to, to talk about it later. So now, now, it's all been replaced by AI, all right? But I would actually strongly suggest you use hand engineered first before using AI, because you can understand these mathematics, these, these mathematical algorithms, but you will not understand what is coming out of a deep learning neural network. Now, granularity feature is different. It's a process of erosion and dilution. So what it does is there'll be a moving window which just goes through, goes across the image, and then it will pick out the, the size of your, of your objects. So in whole image, right, like the, like the face contrast images that I just showed you, I mean, you don't exactly, um, you don't exactly see objects, right? But what it, what it does is that it sees clusters of cells or clusters of repeating patterns and it actually computes a value by image, all right? It's very difficult to understand because it's very abstract, but it actually, it is just detecting repeating patterns that we as humans cannot capture, yeah. So after a lot of cleanup, all right, and um, I finally had 7,000 images, all right, so what did I do? So I split them up into confluency groups, all right, because these are different confluency groups. This is where the cells are more or less at single cell stage. This is where they are starting to organize themselves, right, in groups. And this is where they are compact and they are dense. And I realized that a lot of time when we do drug, drug treatment, we don't consider the compact settings. But in the human brain, right, your GBM cells, they are all compact. We need to get to them, right? So we want to understand that. Yeah. So nine confluency groups. So these are all separated by samples. And then on your y-axis, you have proportion of cells, right? So I did balance them out by having that bit of variance. But on the whole, the mean um, average um, area confluency uh, uh, density is uh, spread out. Then for each of it, I did my principal component analysis, right? So then, of course, it looks very colorful and pretty, but then what is the biological significance, right? So you want to understand PCA. Everyone talks about PCA. So what does PCA1 mean? What does PCA2 mean, right? So you want to have an understanding, all right, is that does this match with their biology? So at that point in time, I didn't have very much of a matched data set, but I was lucky, really I was lucky, and I am very thankful, is that I had 15 sets of bulk RNA data sets that was matched by patient. So the same image, image data sets, 15 patients, I had bulk RNA data sets. So now I have to do something. I have to compromise. So I had to compromise because this is 15, so bulk RNA is averaged, 
by sample, right? So I had to average my PC scores. So I averaged each PC scores for the image feature set. I averaged them by sample. And then I did a correlation, all right? For each set, I correlated them with 113 cell type signatures, all right? Using these 15 bulk RNA data sets. And just to show you quickly what this means is, all right? So now these are confluency groups one to nine, right? So these are the same confluency group one to nine. And this is PC2. So PC2, I'm showing only PC2 here because PC2 was the most obvious, but I saw the signal in PC1 as well. All right, and I can show you later if, you are, if you're interested. But PC2 was clearly showing that regardless, all right, of my density, as the cells are growing, all right, at the lower PCN, my, my lower PC2, all right, my PC2 is always correlated with my neurodevelopmental and my brain cell type signatures. That means signatures that were uh, neural progenitor, um, astrocytic, um, neuronal, all right, they were correlated with my PC2, which means they were always along this end. The samples were just aggregating. While as my mesenchymal, my images, all right, that were from mesenchymal samples, right, they were always anti-correlated. And this is regardless of the density. So as they are growing, it's not random. They are maintaining a pattern that is reflecting their biology. All right. And of course, I these are just this is just exactly this. I just compressed all of this into um, a two-dimensional um, line graph. All right. And this is just further to show you the proportion of. Uh, what do you call it, neurodevelopmental samples that are contributing on each end. But of course, this is not what I want to do, right? I want to go further, right? So if let's say I have, so this is, this is principal component by pixel features, right? That means it's, it's basically, it is, it is distributing my samples along PC2 by the spatial, uh, patterns that it's seeing. So I wanted to see what kind of spatial patterns were this, right? Because is it that mesenchymal inflammatory um, cells have, let's say, a particular type of organization, all right? And do, let's say, uh, neural progenitor, astrocytic, the end of the samples, right? They have a different type of organization, right? Because that is what is important. That's what I want. I want to see if there's meaning to it. Because if it's random, then this simply becomes a predictive tool, right? But if I can understand, all right, what is driving this variance, then I can use it for biological, hierarchical, architectural discovery. So that was what I was aiming for. So now, so just to go through, all right, slowly. So this heat map here, all right, this legend here is now here, all right. So what I actually found, all right, and it's very blur. Um, okay, maybe I'm, I'll just um, do this like this on the, on the blackboard. Maybe that might be better. Okay. So what it does is that I have my PC2, right? Okay, so this is my PC2 low, and this is my PC2 high, okay? So imagine now, my PC2 high is where all my NPC-like, astrocytic-like, OPC-like samples are all enriched here, okay? And my low PC2, okay? This is where my mesenchymal, uh, my, my, my microglia, my samples with microglia signatures, they're all enriched here, okay? What this data is showing is that cells here, right? I better get this correct so that I don't confuse everyone. Um, so yeah, so when, when at low confluency, right, when they're all separate as cells, right? 
what is happening is even I myself cannot see this graph. <laughs> yeah. Um, homogeneity, brands, yeah. So what it is showing is that at low density, this is showing less variance. It is showing increased order. So which means that all of my neural progenitor cells and my OPC cells, they are showing more order. So when the pixels, right, is capturing the pixels, right, from the image. So the computer vision algorithm, it doesn't see whether it's an astrocyte or a mesenchymal, it just sees light or dark, right, pixel in intensity. So what it's showing is that there is actually more order here. So they are more organized, more spread out. But you don't see it here in the mesenchymal cells, all right? But it becomes a little different, all right, when the cells actually become more dense. So when the cells become more dense, all right, there is no difference in their orderliness. All right, and symmetry, okay? Now, for symmetry, it is also, so for symmetry, right, whether it is low or whether it is uh, low density or whether it is high density, the symmetry is always maintained by the mesenchymal and the microglia groups, which means that when you look at an image, right, you can have many kinds of objects even, right? But what is happening is that the variance, right, is cancelling out each other. So there is symmetry here. But here it is losing its symmetry. It is not as symmetric as your mesenchymal or your microglia. So there's a pattern there, all right, that it's picking up. Now, if you're going to ask me, uh, do you see this pattern visually? Uh, no, I don't. So when I see it, I actually don't see the, the patterns at all. But it's picking up, all right? And um, the, only, the only validation, or I've done two validation. So one of it is, this was independently done. So when I, when I did my principal component, it was simply based on pixels, right? So I didn't do uh, any sort of uh, training. So the gradient that we see, is something that is just natural and the correlation does that. I've done another computational method called canonical correlation. So I used a different method, used single cell RNA sequencing data set. I compressed it and the single cell RNA sequencing is also matched but it's coming from a different uh, batch, all right? And I see the correlation but it's just weaker, all right? Now there's a lot of drawbacks to this uh, there's a lot of drawbacks in this study. One of it is that they were not seeded at the same time. They were not seeded at absolutely the same density. So I'm actually correcting for all these technical artifacts when I actually split it up, right? And I also, we also didn't uh, take the imaging. We didn't seed the cells and send it for bug sequencing at the same time. So there is disparity even in the culture conditions. And those of us who've done culture, we know that these cells, they drift, all right? So which is why I used a full-on 113 signatures, all right? And I looked at all the signatures to make sure that whatever they are seeing was real. So I've done like statistics and uh, I think it's strong enough. So I better move on. So the conclusion is, uh, geometric patterning, all right, is an expression of phenotype and function. Uh, so we are very comfortable with this idea, right? When we talk about the heart, the brain, the intestine, you know, but we are not comfortable when we are talking about something like tumor. But um, I think patterns are everywhere. So the expression of like the final architecture. So I'm kind of putting this now into a manuscript. It's under preparation. Uh, and as always, all manuscripts are forever under preparation. <laughs> so hopefully it will be done soon. Yeah, so now I'm going to talk a bit about um, spatial transcriptomics. So it's a big jump, right? Okay, and to be very, to be very frank, from the beginning, I, I wanted to do tissues. And I would have been happy to just do tissue staining and image them and compute the spatial patterning, except that um, we got the xenium. So I started these new projects, all right, and I'm basically transferring all of my ideas 
But the wonderful thing about tissues is that you can do a lot more than just uh, computing phase contrast images, which is just black and white. Yeah, I'm going to explain. Yeah, okay. So, okay. So, the xenium, right? So, um, so you have a flat piece of tissue, all right? So there are different kinds of methods, right? There are different machines, some of you know, but I'll just focus on the xenium, all right? So what the xenium does is this, all right? You have this tissue, right? And then it's standard immunostochemistry, okay? You bake it, you permeabilize, you permeabilize it, blah, 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 all right? And then of course, 10x, all companies will say they have a special recipe, so they put their special recipe on it, all right? And then what happens is, all right, they'll puncture holes in this tissue. And then there are probes. You see these probes? So it's like actually doing QRT-PCR, okay? So you always have to design a probe, right? So just like that, but they use padlock probes, all right? So it's interesting and I would actually encourage everyone to go and read this. Just type in padlock probes. So what padlock probes does is, so the bioinformatic, the bioinformatics team, so you give, so Xenium, right, they are targeted, okay? So you have to give them 500 genes, okay? Your favorite genes, okay? So you can choose between 50 to 500 genes. And then the bioinformatics team will design probes all right, so these probes will circularize. All right, they will actually ligate in a circular manner. And the reason, and there's no space here, by right. All right, so there shouldn't be a space here, okay? There's no space here. And then an enzyme will come, will, will uh, ligate it, and then it will do rolling circle amplification, and then you'll get these nanoballs, all right? DNA nanoballs. So you have now all these DNA nanoballs, different, different colors. Actually, there's only four colors. All right, I'm just going to skip a bit because they actually remove the probes and add again. They cycle the image many, many times. All right, so it will image. All right, so each each point right where it fluoresces is one transcript that is detected. Actually, no, I shouldn't say one transcript. It is a point. All right, that is detected. So at that point, all right the machine has detected a transcript presence, all right? And it will be imaged as a point, all right? So it is a binary mechanism. It's yes or no, whether GFAP is there or not, right? Right, it's points, right? So they will image all of this, all right? And then of course, you know, you need to apply single cell segmentation, right? So what? Xenium does, Xenium will apply their own algorithm, okay? So it will image, there will be an image, nice image, all right, that will show all these spots, all right, and they use some sort of machine learning, probabilistic modeling, all right, to make sure that the points are reliable, okay? And then they will apply your single cell segmentation. And by the way, you can do your own single cell segmentation. You don't have to follow the us. You can modularize this. So the end of it is you will get an image. You actually don't get the image. The image, they never release it. You will get a matrix, all right? You will get a matrix where you will get all of these spots, right? So each transcript, you will get an XY coordinate, all right? So this is for your transcript. But because they apply your single cell segmentation for you, all right, they will also give you another file, which is cell, all right? So they'll get the center of your cell, and then they'll give you a XY coordinate for the centroid, for the cell centroid. So this is the same for the um, Xenium, Murfish, uh, what is the other one, COSMX. It's all the same principle. The only difference is their chemistry. They all use different kinds of probes, right? Something like your RNA. 
you know, you have your, you know, like your antisense, you know, they, they have different backbones, right? Yeah, but the, at the end of the day, the, the principle is you hybridize, all right, to the probes, you amplify it. Xenium is the only one that amplifies so far. The rest, like Mersco and uh, Cosmex, they don't amplify as much. So the signal is very strong in the Xenium. All right, so this is what we call molecular profiling. It is like the latest invention in spatial transcriptomics. How good they are or not, I'm not sure. I think it depends on the purpose. All right, so for me, this is great because I want to do single cell. I want to look at the shape and the organization. But if you're not interested in that, I mean, 500 genes is not a big deal, right? So you might as well use something like Visium or Visium HD or Stormix. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell 10x I said that. Yeah. So, yeah, so the thing is, it goes through this, and then in the end, you get this output, right? So this is spots, okay? Now, the spots, the resolution is a very good resolution, I have to admit. It's about less than 50 nanometer. So it is actually true to what they say. It is almost single molecular. All right. Merscope is about 100 nanometers. COSMX, I'm not sure, um, but they're close. All right. And um, they use different kind of uh, microscopy techniques uh, that you can read online. So they've all kind of conceptualized for spatial transcriptomics. All right. Okay. So my 414 genes, right, that I targeted were very specific, all right? So I, I, for me, the blood vessels are important, all right? And then, of course, I had immune cells, progenitor cells, um, injury response because my lab, we study the injury response. I had neuronal, um, OPC, developmental, all right? But the beauty of, of this is really, right? Um, so, yeah, just to, before I go into that, so um, the samples, I had a whole bunch of patient samples, and I also tried xenograph models, okay? So without going into the actual image, oh yeah, so I forget. So when, when 10X runs this in their Xenium machine, right, they will image, they will, stain it, they will stain your tissue with DAPI, all right? And then they'll image just the DAPI stain, and they'll give it to you, all right? And then you can take that tissue afterwards and you can label it with your favorite uh, protein markers. Yeah, so you can give it to Codex, IMC, you can do anything you want. You don't have to, to use their module. They're coming up with a protein module, but you don't have to use it. And you can even do h and &E. Okay, so this is the tissue, all right? So because it is actual single cell resolution, right, you can actually see the vessels very clearly. So all those who have done Visium data sets, you will not get this degree of granularity, all right? But of course, it is still not as perfect as an image itself, right? But you can still get the identity of it. So this one is where I've blown it up. So this is a segmentation that, um, that I've kind of overlaid, but it's from the Xenia, right? but I prefer not to use their segmentation. So these points here that I'm showing you, um, these are actually cell centroids, all right? So this is the center of the cell, all right, that it's computing. But when you look at cell centroids, it doesn't give you the cell shape, all right? So now I've superimposed the cell shape over it, all right? But the Xenium cell segmentation is not accurate. So I always like to use another method. Now for the mouse, it's just an example. So this one, I blew it up. Now this, these are transcripts, all right? So these are actually transcripts, okay? So I downsampled it, all right, to like just 0.1% of the total transcript. So I used, I experimented with a mouse xenograph. So if it's a xenograph with just 500 genes, you will not be able to differentiate normal from tumor. It's very difficult, right? Okay, and because mouse and human, we share a lot of genes, it will be very difficult. So I actually added, a collaborator suggested this. So we added human-specific NCL, all right? So you find that all these um, 
points where it's gray, these are all um, purely um, human, all right? And then the, the colored cells are basically what I would call, um, what do you call it, my genes of interest, all right? So each point here, each color is a different gene. So you can actually have this granularity from the Xenium, from Cosmax, from Mersco. These are all molecular uh, profiling. Okay, so you do general single cell sequencing. Importantly, you identify and classify the tumor, blood vessels, and the immune cells. And then, of course, right, now it's more complex. You know, just now it's easy. So how do, I, how do we integrate pattern description with transcriptomics, okay? So the thing is, right, sometimes we are very naive. So there was this, I would also, I like this paper. I think it made a lot of sense to me and I think a lot of vet lab biologists might like this paper. I might be wrong, but I think it was a very uh, logical, uh, thoughtful paper. So what they did was, all right, Basically, they look at a cell's neighbor. So this is a cell, right? So I can group and cluster my cells by the cell expression, right? So cells which are similarly expressed will cluster together. But I can also group cells by their neighborhood. So in this case, coming back to the same example, I can also group all of you by where you are sitting together as a lab, right? Instead of individually, right? It will be completely different. And then they did something which was very nice. They used, they borrowed a computer vision uh, algorithm and they computed the gradient of expression because we tend to sit next to someone that we are familiar with, but the person next to us will sit next to someone they are familiar with, but I might not be very familiar with that person, right? So they compute that gradient as well, which I thought was really cool actually, yeah. All right, so spatial is nice because you can do these things, right? You can look at the spatial. So in this case, right, cell type focused means that I'm just doing clustering by cell type. So you see it's very distributed. But then when you look at it from a regional focus where you're taking into account their environment, then it becomes a bit more uh, ordered, right? So this you can see here, all right? So I blew this up, all right? So I blew these regions up. And if you look at it, right, you see it is more heterogeneous when it is cell type focused and it is more homogeneous. So there's something here, all right? All the cells here, all right? They're kind of clustering together in some order, even though they are very diverse when it comes to their single cell type, all right? And then these are actually blood vessels or immune cells, I forget. And then these are being picked up by your single cells, but they're not being picked up here. So it is, it is actually identifying broad patterns, which again, we might not be good at visualizing or capturing, right? So I'm gonna end soon. So this is work in progress, all right? So like I said, I don't like the cell segmentation, so I'm replacing it. And I'm working on that uh, spatial and the non-spatial uh, clustering method. And then you don't just want to cluster them. Importantly, you want to identify what is the motivation behind that clustering, right? So, for instance, I talked so much about the whole neurodevelopmental gradient. How does it look like here, right? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's totally like, like variable and it doesn't have any kind of a pattern or synchrony, right? Because in culture, all right, what we think is a gradient computationally will be completely discrete when it comes to the real, um, what do you call it, um, what do you call it, uh, the, when you look at the tissue itself, right? So we don't know, right? So these are things that we want to look at, that I want to look at. So one of the things that I thought I could show you today, but it keeps failing, um, so to overlap these images that I've stained with the transcription, all right? Because transcription will give me a different signal. But things like the texture of my extracellular matrix, the 
the, the shape of my astrocytes, all right? These uh, filaments, all right, the direction of these filaments, these processes, which no RNA or protein can actually capture, right? I need some sort of a pattern descriptor to capture this. So this is where I feel the pattern description will complement the spatial transcriptomics, right? So you don't want to do just more RNA, right? I mean, you want to do something else that will complement and make it more powerful. And yeah. Yeah, so that's that's still in progress. So yeah, so I like to merge uh, wet lab and and uh, computational. I think it's uh, more fun, or maybe it's just me. So I I think there is so much of a uh, data set outside out there. There's so much to learn, and uh, there's this huge uh, computational expansion. I think we can learn and start to understand like. Many of these properties, I think, were already described in papers, right? It's just that they were described in small, small units, right? Now everything is coming together, right? So I think we can look at all these patterns together and we can try to uncover what is it that, that drives, like, function, right? And I think that's very important for me, at least for GBM, uh, maybe because Personally, I worked with these people from my from my charity, and I see them. And uh, yeah, you know, I think I think at the end of it, there's there's really someone working, someone waiting for a for a cure. So the biological question that I want to answer would be to complement the principles of uh, engineering to computer vision, AI, and single cell analysis, so that we can better understand that phenotypic space, right? And a lot of people want to answer that. So I think it's a good time for everyone to work together from all disciplines. Yeah. So this is from a movie, but I really like the quote, is that we cannot break the laws of nature, but we can shine light on new laws and learn from them. Yeah. So that's the end. I'm sorry I took a bit long. I especially want to thank uh, Madeline and her lab yeah, for inviting me here. Really, really, and yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I was very honored. Yeah, maybe I overdid my presentation, but yeah. Yeah, I can take questions. Yeah. Do you have any idea how to do that? So there are different, so it depends on what you want, right? So if, let's say you treat, um, uh, so I, there are a couple of papers out there and it's, um, so usually pattern discovery has been used to predict. So you see a lot of machine learning models, like computer vision was, was a lot of it was used to predict, you know, um, what do you call it, entropy, stability, and then it got transferred to image, right? So just to let you all know, like computer vision algorithms that I use were used to measure differences in grassland between, between the countries, you know? So uh, you, can, you can treat the drugs, you can treat, you can treat them with drugs, and you can compute all of these um, uh, algorithms out, and you can even use deep learning neural networks out there if you're not interested in understanding, right? So what this will do is the neural network will train, 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 test, 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 and it will understand the pattern, okay? But you won't know what the pattern is, right? It will store the pattern, and then you can give it um, your input data now, okay? So there are ways to do it. Number one, you just want to predict, use this training model to predict whether your drug worked or not, okay? So in this case, um, this is what I think, all right? Many people will argue that, no, if I treat a cell, a cell must, the cell must die, then the drug is working. But I think that is thinking of it too simplistically because visually I'm sure many of you noticed that I see something happening to my cells when I give a drug, but it's not dying, all right? 
that is valuable data. You don't know why it's changing, right? And there's so much that we don't know. And it could just be that maybe the drug is almost hitting its target and then it got rewired, right? So that is important data that we cannot get from viability tests. We cannot get from one or two biomarkers. So you can do that and we can store this and we can understand, right? And if you want to go a bit more, you can do what I did and quite a, quite a few groups have done this. They have also taken the same samples and they've done it for, they've sent it for bulk RNA sequencing or single cell RNA sequencing and then they merge it and they train it. So you train molecular data as well. So when you feed it with new data, which is blind, it can find the connections. Yeah, there was a, there was a study where uh, they've done where they treated drugs, all right, different drugs, all right, completely with different chemistries, but they found that the morpholo morphology was, was so similar all right, that they suspect that it's because the intracellular signaling is also similar, which also makes sense, right? Because what is happening inside is what is driving the outside. Of course, you can argue against that, but what I mean is that you can complement these two, right? Yeah, so I feel that you are throwing away, maybe we are throwing away a lot of uh, drugs and it, it is also good for, for us when we are testing out drugs, right? For example, DMSO. Sometimes DMSO it really, you know, it messes up. Sometimes, um, let's say, um, so what do you use a control? So let's say you, 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 you deliver, okay, DMSO is a very simple example. So if you give it DMSO, all right, um, or you give it just, just normal, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, media, so when do you stop your experiment, right? So when, when I notice that when my cells are very, very, very confluent, right? They start to lose their pattern, all right? They no longer confirm, they become random. And why? Because they are now just struggling to survive. So they are growing randomly, right? They are dying in droves. Like I had like images and I'm not showing it because they are also not good for my paper. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, so I had images where the cells just lifted off, right? So sometimes you also want, I feel that it's also good to do this because we are not pushing our cells enough when we treat them with drugs, you know? So we can push this and we can look at, at, at the different densities. I think the density actually matters because they are interacting with each other, right? And we can, and I think you can really be very creative, right? I've only shown you one way. You can, I mean, you guys are definitely better than me. But you can be creative and apply this to organoids. Uh, you can apply this to, um, let's say you have sliced tissue and then you grow cells on it, all right? You can capture the images, right? So maybe what you might think as it didn't work might actually be working, you know? So there are many ways in which you can use an image and we have thousands of it outside. Yeah, we have really so much of image. We are underutilizing it. Yeah. So, so the thing with low grades, right, they don't grow very well in culture as well. Um, I feel it's better to use um, tissues um, or maybe um, what do you call it um, on, on live tissue, uh, live uh, tissue sections and you grow them. But <clears throat> if I were to hypothesize, right, they are considered as two different diseases. I think they would behave, actually no, you know, I take that back. They are considered two different diseases, right, because of their genomics, right, they are, they are very divergent, all right. But maybe you might find that um, the way they are organizing themselves 
or the cell types that are existing, their shapes, their morphometry, their way they're interacting might actually be very similar because they still have to survive in the brain. It's just that they're going at a much slower rate. Yeah, they are very, very slow. Yeah. And if you can study low grades, that would be good because it's, it's very understudied. I know it's the better of the two, but I mean, there are still people who are affected by it and they're still suffering from it, right? But yeah, so you might, I think you might end up, I won't be surprised if you find that they are very similar, actually, the way they interact. But perhaps, because genomics, there are lots of redundant pathways, right? We always forget. There are so many redundant pathways. So just because one pathway is promoting a neuronal signature, it doesn't mean that I cannot have another pathway promoting the same neuronal signature or the same kind of phylopodial, uh, what you call it, uh, movements, right? Because it is, it is just, you know, it, the DNA is just huge, right? And we know, right, there's so many papers that show us that there's redundancy in biology. So maybe their mechanisms might be different intri intrinsically, but because they have to interact, right, with the same environment, the output phenotype might be might be the same. So it's like convergent ev evolution. Yeah, something like that. So yeah, you, I'm, I won't be surprised if you end up finding it's the same. When you use patient samples, do you see if it was from a primary lymphoma or secondary one? Uh, if the came from another tumor in the body, uh, the question is, does it behave similarly? similarly? I don't do know. I would love to, yeah, but I don't know yet. Yeah, because the problem with spatial, right? And it is something that we should not underestimate, right? Just because I have, um, you know, like sometimes when I when I tell people I have like 14 spatial data sets, they're like, oh, wow, it's nothing. It's really nothing because there are like papers, statisticians who will tell you that one slice from one GBM will not give you the spatially relevant statistics. You cannot predict from one slice from a patient what is happening in that entire tumor. You know, it's just one slice. You know, GBM is so heterogeneous, you just five, five micrometer up and everything will change. You know, I'm sure it's, we've all done this. We section and we, we, we stain for blood vessel and we happily think we can, we can register them. And then the blood vessel is missing in the next slide. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's very naive of us to think that. And the statist statisticians always warn uh, us, you know, don't, uh, the statistics is not there yet, right? So, 14 data sets, right, might not even be sufficient to cover GBM. And then to compare, let's say, an external metastatic GBM with this, I might falsely come to the conclusion there is a difference when actually there isn't, right? Because I don't have the power of analysis. That's why tissue microarray is very debatable. So I have, I have collaborators who say that I only want to do tissue microarray. They are the best for the, the for clinical. Then the statistician will come and say that's rubbish. You know, you don't have the power of uh, the the power of power analysis to do that, right? and it actually does make sense, right? So we haven't reached there, but because there's so much of data out there, eventually I think we can make use of it, right? Yeah, and then we live in the age of open science. People have to share data, right? So, you know, as it accumulates, maybe one day we can reliably do that, yeah. Okay. Approach. So you have limitations because of the cost of the, the, the score? So, so now they have a limitation of 500. The cost of max is now, the cost of max now has 2,000. 
is it 2,000? Yeah, yeah. No, is it 2,000 or 5,000? I can't remember. I think it's 2,000. But the MERS code can go up to 1,000. The problem with all these machines, right, as fancy as they sound, not so fancy. So all those of us who do microscope, we know there is an optical limit, right? That's a threshold. You cannot, you cannot have your signal too high, right? So even with four antibodies, we can hit the limit, right? So imagine they have 400. I mean, yes, right? So the thing is there is an optical budget. And when, when I do the design, all right, a lot of my genes fail. I cannot even have them, which is why the Xenium, with the Xenium, I cannot have any copy number genes in it. I try to put in copy number genes, it rejects it, right? It doesn't. But when you, when you use something like the Mersco, it is a bit lower. And I was doing this analysis for a collaborator. She treated a mouse with something and another mouse was untreated. With the Xenium, I couldn't see a difference. But with the Merscope, I could see the difference because the optical budget hasn't been hit in the Merscope because it is not amplifying like the Xenium, right? So these technologies are very new, you know? So I think we need to use them with caution. But Xenex, they have said, that it that their 5000 gene panel is coming end of this year all right but i will say wait first right yeah because the visium hd is coming so the the visium hd is not you don't have to choose you just give them the tissue at two micron two micron by two micron spots it will just uh, sequence all you just won't get single cell sequencing so there's a limit to these spatial transcriptomics so Unless you really need that morphometry, that cell segmentation, the point localization, you know, or you feel that like uh, the Allen Institute, they were, they were very honest. They were like, we know our 300 genes that we want that will define all these cell types. And they did their Moscope um, analysis, you know. So you have to be very sure. If not, just do um, Visium HD or Stormix. You'll get more value out of this. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's the, it's the same argument, right? Like some people will say, no, let's do a big tissue per slide. And then some people say, no, let's do tissue microarray spots, right? But the size will matter. But when you, when you, have a, when you want to occupy a bigger space, all right, you also have to consider the fact everything that is technical for an image is also relevant here, right? So when we image, right, something, and it goes through another slide, you are introducing technical batch, you know, and then your, your photon detection, everything is going to be a bit variable. So you want a bit, you want to, you want, yeah, it's a challenge again. You want to compromise, you want to make uh, your technical, uh, you want to suffer less technically, you want to use tissue microarray, but then you're losing your power analysis. Then you still have to end up doing more slides, I think. Yeah, yeah, but it really is, um, yeah, what questions do you want to ask? Yeah, yeah, just just use it with caution because we don't have the, I think we don't have the statistical power yet. Yeah. So thank you very much, Queen, for coming to share with us your nice results in the questions. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned in this, your first slide.